All right, so now the fun begins. So, most of the rest of the course is variations on the theme, and that theme is analysis of variance. Um, okay, so we've talked about t tests and z tests, right? And how we can use those, usually as t tests, to compare one group to a mean or two groups. So we can do either of those things very effectively with t-tests and z-tests. Um, but as you probably know, there's way more than, most experiments have more than two groups. So we need a way to compare means of more than two groups. So let's just say we have three, three groups here. They have an independent variable called A. Yes, I've, I'm so out of ideas. But experiments, I'm just giving you the names of variables like A. There are three levels of A, one, two, and three. Numbers don't matter so much. The point is, we've got a pretty simple design here. We've got three subjects per group. And we want to know if these means, 84, 74, and 59, are different from each other. Really, I guess more generally, what you're really asking is, are any of these two means different? That's really all we're asking. So we've got a set of scores, nine scores here. So here's the question. Why do the scores vary? Why aren't they all exactly the same? Right. So the other way to put this is, what are the sources of variation? And well, individual differences is the first thing people think of. So if we've got three subjects per group, so that's three people in each group, and we've got the nine scores all told, because we have three different levels of the independent variable A. One of the reasons the scores vary is because everybody's a little, diff a little bit different than everybody else. Just one thing, individual differences. We're all special snowflakes. And of course, there's going to be potentially group differences. Right? We don't know for sure if there's group differences, but it's a good guess. We kind of hope there are, we would do the experiment. Right? Does that make sense? Literally, if you understand that, that's the basis for how analysis of variance works is that we have different sources of variation, and let's, part, let's, let's pull them apart and find out if this group difference variance is bigger than we would expect just because we have individual differences. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, pretty straightforward, I hope it's pretty straightforward. Okay, so any score is a combination of a few different things. The first thing is just being a human being. There's a baseline level. And that's going to be the same for all of us. That's the same for all of us. And then scores go up or down because of two things. If you're in a different group, and because you're different people. Okay? There's some baseline level that we all have, and then scores are elevated or depressed based on individual differences and group membership. Okay, is that, again, questions so far? Make sure you ask questions on this stuff because this is the basis of the course until sometime well into March. So it's sensible enough? Okay. So we can make this into math. We can, which is just, we can write always, we always could write out any score equals some sort of baseline level and then group effects and then individual differences, or we could say x equals mu plus tau plus epsilon. Okay? Because it's easier to say, it's quicker. And we don't have to write out all those words. X is at a score, that's the grand mean. 
right? That's the treatment effect, and that's the individual difference, or error. Typically, in statistics, when we can't directly explain something, we just call it error. That means it's wrong. So x equals mu plus tau plus epsilon. Say that to yourself five times every night before you go to bed. Don't, that's weird. But if you can get through your head what I mean by this, and what I mean by this is that any score equals the grand mean plus the treatment effect plus error. Okay? It's called the structural model of analysis of variance. What did I do? No, I just typed out everything, everything meant, and then the next slide. Happened. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I did that too. Okay, well, don't, you know what, though? Taking notes, there are data on this like crazy. The act of taking notes helps your grades, even if you are provided with everything in advance. Writing stuff down helps you remember. It's just like highlighting. You know when you highlight things in your textbook? Right? Um, the act of highlighting helps you more than if an expert highlights the important things for you. Right. Now, if you're highlighting basically everything, remember that in the first year you just highlight everything? You basically <laughs> just dip your whole book in yellow ink and then you pick it out. Probably work better. Um, but at this, you guys are now at the level, you, you know what's important, what isn't. For example, my little stories about being high in graduate school have really nothing to do with statistics. Don't write those down. Feel free to, I don't care. But, You know what the important stuff is, write it down. Seriously. Or even if you got the notes and you just have those in advance, just highlight stuff even. It really helps. Okay, so it's not all writing stuff down. It's good that you're doing that. It's good that you're doing that. So any score equals the grand mean plus the treatment effect plus error. Okay. X equals mu plus tau plus epsilon. So let's make some assumptions. Never make an assumption. It makes an ass out of you and me. I love stupid expressions. And by love, I mean I hate them with the intensity of a thousand suns. Here's an assumption. Mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3 equals dot 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 equals mu sub k. There are k groups. And if that's true, <coughs> therefore, that's what that means. Remember that? Math in high school? Sigma squared sub one plus equals sigma squared sub two equals sigma squared sub three equals dot 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 equals sigma squared sub k. All I'm saying there is HO is true. If those two things are true, I'm saying HO is true. This is what's called the null hypothesis assumption. We make this assumption uh, with every statistical kind of test we do. That's all this is. I'm assuming, I start up by assuming the null is true, right? Because if the means are the same and the variances are the same, that means they come from the same distribution. Yes? Okay. I see some knowing, no answer you're following me so far, this is good. It gets hard in a second, but so far I think it's okay. I'm warning you that it gets hard so you can ask questions, okay? You must understand that when I say are there any questions and there's no questions, I assume that you know it perfectly. Because there's nothing else. I'm not going to assume you know nothing. Because that would mean I'm not very good at my job, and I, will, I, I refuse to entertain that notion. OK, so HO is true. We just always assume that. We start that, start that way. OK. Scores are randomly and normally distributed around the grand mean. We're just going to assume that. That's being assumed to, so the math that's behind this that you don't have to learn, the really deep calculus stuff you have to learn, it makes it work. But it's not a ridiculous assumption. Really. The observations themselves, the scores are independent of each other. By the way, we can kind of violate the hell out of this one. 
they don't have to be they don't have to be normal. We can't ever violate this. We can't ever violate independent events. So if I know Mitch's score, I don't know Richard's score. I can't. I can't know anything about Richard's score by looking at Mitch's score. I can't. If I do, we've done, we've, well, we've got bad research design. We, we take care of this assumption through, a, through doing our research properly. Okay? So they're independent events. But yeah. What would be an example of research where the uh, sure. observations aren't? Well, there is a special case which we take care of, which is if we did repeated measures, if I know your score on before, I can make a guess at your score after, because I know your individual difference scores. We take care of that, though, by statistically. On the other hand, here's one. Be bad. What if we were doing like sampling with replacement of something? So you get to pick some item, whatever the hell it is. You know, like you get ten things to choose from, and you could you can pick one of them. Now the next person to pick is Richard, but we're doing sampling with without replacement. Well, sorry, with repl uh, yeah, without replacement. So let's say now now he's only got nine things to choose from. So his score is now affected by your behavior. We can't have that. There are ways to, there are to, to statistically analyze data like that. They just don't involve this kind of statistics. Right? Because finally, if we get to the ninth person, we now know what their score is. Because all, all the other choices are gone. Right? So we finally go and we get to Joey, and, and he goes, yeah, well, the only one left here is I guess I have to eat Asparagus. I love asparagus. I, I, I was going to say something else. I chose not to be uh, gross. You can make up your own joke, whatever you think it might be. It was nothing sexual. That's all I'm just going to say. But it, it was a joke. That it was poo in it. That's all I'm saying. But so I basically told you what I was going to say. God, why do I? It, you, I should learn not to say everything that comes to mind. <laughs> Actually, I don't. You would not believe the stuff that I edit out. But you see how that would be bad? Like, eventually we'd know everybody's score by knowing the score before them. Or the other way we can think of it is that Mitch is cheating off his arm. <laughs> That's great. That's, at first I didn't realize what you think you're looking over. That was great. He's like, he was cheating. It was, that was apparently a joke just for me. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, that's, that is more likely to happen in, in, in a, say, one of our psychological experiments, right? So let's say we're doing a memory test. And I have people doing free recall. And everybody takes things like that way too seriously because everyone thinks everything is an IQ test. They do. One of the key things to tell people, by the way, when you guys will get there with your thesis, if you're doing anything that's paper and pencil or memory related, they have to write something down, say, this is not an IQ test. Just make sure people know that. Because people take things way, way too seriously. It's like, well, I better, they're gonna get the best memory in the world. And they, some, some people literally will cheat. They will. So, people cheat. And if they do that, now the observations are independent. That's where it could happen, not with shitty research design, like the weird experiment where we're choosing different things to eat, but in an experiment where you have just people like that sitting beside each other and cheating. That can happen. Because people, your subjects are students, they're sitting in a classroom, everything seems like school, since I'm going to do as well as I can. Hopefully I'll do perfectly, and maybe the government will come and use me to solve crimes. Like, I don't know what goes through people's heads. So, we want independent observations. Oh, and all sources of variation are in the model. So that model that says x equals mu plus tau plus epsilon, that's the only sources of variation. So, and note again, that kind of then speaks to independent observations, because there's nothing in there that says, except if you're Richard. And you're sitting, and, you, and, Rich, and Mitch already made a choice. It doesn't say that anywhere in the model. You could make a model like that. It would be weird, but I guess one could do it. 
And in a special case, when it's the same person tested over and over again, as I said, we actually can put that in the model. That can be done. We're not there yet. We'll get there in a week and a half. Questions so far? These assumptions are pretty standard assumptions made for statistical tests. Oh, no. That looks like math. It's because it is. OK. Sigma squared sub 1 is roughly equal to s squared sub 1. Yes? Right? Because so the, the, the variance of group 1 in the population, we can estimate that with s squared sub 1. Yes? Makes sense. Yeah, right? That's all. OK. That's I, just changing the subscripts. So that's good. So sigma squared sub epsilon, that's the variance due to individual individuals being different, equals the variance of individual scores, of all your scores. So let's say you're all in the experiment. Individual differences. You're all in the experiment. Whatever the hell it is. And you're representing all statistics students in the third year stats course in the world. And you're some kind of random sample. Which you're not, but let's think about that. If I took the variance of all your scores and calculated it, I'd get a pretty good estimate of the variance of the population, right? That follows. But you're all in different groups. You're in your group one, your group two, your group three, okay? If I took the average of group one's variance and group two's variance and group three's variance, that should equal the variance of everybody, yes? Because everybody's variance is the same. Does that, does that make sense? So I got three groups. And I said in the one of the assumptions is all the variance is the same. So if all the variance is the same, your variance, let's say it's five, and your variance, that's group two, is uh, eight. And your variance uh, is six. That adds up to. 18? Yeah. That's what I got to. Anyway, it matter. I divide that by 3, I should get the average variance. That's what I have. It should be the same as the actual variance. Does that make sense? It does, right? Which is, and the J just means the Jth group. J could equal 1, J could equal 2, J could equal 3, J could equal eventually K. Or K equals. So s squared sub j divided by k, I, and that's the summation of the sum of all the sum of all of the variances, variance for group one plus variance for group two plus variance for group three, divided by the number of groups should be the same as the variance for everybody. Right? So you're thinking, why are you averaging variances? Or can you average variances rather? Yeah, sure, the numbers don't really come from. They don't deliver answers, they don't care. Okay? Are you with me so far? Is that math that it's not scary? It's got a Greek letter. A little scary. Greek letter's a little scary. Yes, please, Diamond. Um, so just J would be whatever group we're working on? That's right. J is group one, J is group two. Because you're summing it. I didn't put the subscript and the superscript on the summation, but it should be J goes from one up to K. Right, so if you're used to this from math class years ago, it would say J equals one under here and up to K over here. I'm being a little lazy. We use, we use math as a tool, we're not mathematicians. Okay. I'm usually not gonna put the indices in a summation sign, just because it's more work. And working with the Microsoft equation editor is a, is a hellish nightmare, <laughs> so. The end thing. Pardon me? The end thing, you can like, Oh, yeah? Yeah. Well, it's too late now. I've made these slides. And the nice thing about this stuff is it don't change. <laughs> so I made these slides in 2007, and they're fine. 
Okay, so so far you're good, right? That's fine. Okay, now let's do some more. Ah! Okay, this isn't that bad either. The variance of, of x bar, this is the central limit theorem, the sigma squared over n, isn't it? That's just true. That just is. That's the central limit theorem. It's, you take that as gospel, yeah? Okay. So that says then that the variance of x bar, s squared sub x bar, should equal this, right? I just wrote, instead of writing ver x bar, I'm saying s, s squared sub x bar. Again, I'm now taking the mean of group one, the mean of group two, and the mean of group three, and I'm taking the variance of those three means. You're thinking you take variances of means? Again, the numbers don't know where they come from. They're just numbers. So why not? So s squared sub x bar, uh, it shouldn't really be equals. It should be equals approximately, but that's going to be good enough. It's close enough for rock and roll. Equals sigma squared sub epsilon divided by n. Oh, look. Well, well, we can just cross multiply and get sigma squared sub epsilon equals s squared sub x bar times n. I'm just isolating sigma squared sub epsilon. Just like in the last slide, we had isolated sigma squared sub epsilon. Okay? I'm trying to get a way to figure out what the variance do to group, sorry, to individual differences is. Okay? That's all I'm doing. Okay. Questions about that? That's straight to the central limit theorem. Great. When you sub x bar, are you adding those values? All the variances? Like These are variances. This, this is first. like mean of group one, mean of group two, mean of group three. You mean here? Yeah. It's saying the same thing as this. Okay, so you're just taking all the variances for the groups? Not the variances, I'm taking the means. I'm taking the variance of those means. So the, the variance? Of the means. Right. Yeah. Not of individual scores, of the three, of the in our case, of the means. Of the means. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. That's why it says s squared sub x bar, not s squared sub x. Okay. Good. Other questions? Mm. Um, so, the, this slide and the last one are both calculating the same thing? Yeah. With different, different, different sets of numbers, different ways of calculating the same thing. It's exactly what they are. Thank you. Spoiler alert, it's the next slide. Madison. Can you just break down the bottom part one more time? Sure. So the very bottom, if I said s, s squared sub x bar equals sigma squared sub epsilon over n, so you're okay there, right? I cross multiply. What's epsilon again? Uh, that's error. Okay. Individual differences. Okay. Yeah, I just cross multiply that since all of us. So I can isolate sigma, squ uh, sigma squared sub epsilon. Yeah. So it's okay. Yeah. s squared sub x bar times n equals sigma squared sub epsilon times well, one. Times one. Then, exactly what it is. Do you just like know the error? Well, no, we're going to try to estimate. We're trying to estimate. So you, okay. Yeah, we're trying to estimate a parameter with statistics. Gotcha. Yeah. If you look on the last slide, the same thing. We've got statistics on one side, parameter on the other. We're trying to estimate error variance, or var error variance, which is variance due to individual differences. Yep. At some point, can we possibly do an example? That would be wonderful. Sure. Like, just to visually yep. see it, um, putting, like, together like a random sample and actually see. OK. So like, let's say if we have group one, group two, group three, and they have a mean, and they have a variance. Group one is going to have a mean of 10, 20, 30. I'm going to do this to make math easy for myself. <laughs> and the variance is going to be 10 squared 100 over 2 times 100 divided by 2. That's the variance. It's going to be 100. So the variance here is going to be. Pardon me? Don't go where we can't follow. <laughs> Were you actually?
actually quote it not for October because that's great if you want. Yes. Thank you. Where I'm going. You got your phone. Okay. So I just made up some numbers. Okay? I'm not going to give you individual scores. I don't feel like doing that. Because that's way too much arithmetic in my head for now or later. Okay. So what's the variance of these means? Well, we would go, well, what's the mean of those means? 20, right? So if I said, if I was going to get the variance of the means, it's going to equal 10 minus 20 squared plus 0, 20 minus 20 squared, plus 30 minus 20 squared divided by 2 degrees of freedom, 2. So it's going to be 200. Right? That's 100, and that's 100, and that's going to be 0. So it's 200 divided by 2, which equals 100. Right? OK? Yeah. Now, let's do, the, let's do the average of those variances. Because that's what the other slide is, right? It's the average of those variances, correct? Remember that is s squared uh, over k. k is 3 here. We've got three groups. 90 plus 110. So the, uh, uh, sorry. Equals 90 plus 100 plus 110 over 3, which equals 100. That never comes out that beautifully. I cook the numbers. Mm -hmm. That's why it comes out like that. Yeah. What are you doing over there? Over here, I'm getting, go back to the last slide, and you'll see that the, I'm getting the average of the variances. Okay. Yeah. Right. So if you go back to the last thing that said uh, s squared, uh, some of the s squared over k equals s bar squared sub x bar. That's what I have there. That's what I have there. Is this the formula that would require j? Yeah. OK, so what would j? j goes, well, j, j equals 1, j equals 2, j equals 3. So we would say. So your k is just j? Yeah, like that's what I'm assuming, right? No. no? J, j is not k. j is j. <laughs> I did that, I did that on purpose. So J, so J, J is the index, J is the group number. J could be 1, J could be 2, oh, okay. J could be 3. K in this case is 3. There are 3 groups. Gotcha. So there are we, 3 groups! As long as we know that though, but like in our heads, we need to actually like show that on paper? Like, Don't worry about showing anything on paper. Okay. Because I just think of it as K. <laughs> well, but see, K is the number of groups, so don't think of it as K. K like separately 3 times. K, K, K. <laughs> K equals 1, then K equals 2, then K equals 3. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way I think of it. That's, no, that's correct. So that should be the way you think of it. K equals 1, then K equals 2, then K equals 3. Yes. You ever, anybody here ever write computer programs? A little bit? So you're doing a 4 next loop, and K goes from 1 to 3. If that helps anybody? <laughs> <laughs> that didn't help. Huh? That's the distance. This did. Yeah. The, the thing with K's and 1's and 3's. I will take pictures of those yeah. and put them on the, um, on my, uh, on the blog, on the, what's the name, on the, uh, on the podcast. Okay. Watching the YouTube video, internet people go to my blog and you'll see this. People do. It's weird. It's mentioned in the stats book so people watch my YouTube videos. But, it, but then I don't have enough to make to put ads on it, so I can't make any money off this. But do you really want to see an ad for Ram Dodge Ram trucks in the middle of this lecture? Maybe might make it interesting. So, did, so that helped, right? Doing a little bit of. Arithmetic there, I hope. Okay. We now have two independent 
estimates of sigma squared sub epsilon, of variance due to individual differences. Because that's all we're doing there is trying to find, to estimate a parameter, sigma squared sub epsilon, or we might all probably often just call it epsilon from the, from the structural model, with from statistics. This equals this equals this. That's called mean squared treatment. That's called mean squared error. Whoops! Let's go back. So. Again? You know, okay. Don't touch. Don't touch. That's mean squared treatment, that's mean squared error. That's where those things come from. So when you were told, when, when you taught, learned about analysis of variance in, in intro stats in 2126, which I haven't taught in nine years, so I don't know what happens anymore. But you taught a little bit about analysis of variance, right? Like just introducing the concept. And you were talking about mean squared treatment and mean squared error, or mean squared between groups and mean squared within groups, yes? And you were told there are two things. Were you ever shown how to calculate them? No, it doesn't matter. No one calculates it by hand. You, you, you wouldn't do that by hand. Why would you? You, you have a computer in front of you. Right? But that's what these two things are. They're, so mean square treatment is mean square between groups. This is mean square within groups. Okay. So now we have these two estimates of sigma squared sub epsilon. The expected value, if HO is true, of mean squared error and mean squared treatment is both sigma squared and epsilon. Like right? we've gone through the last 15 minutes, hopefully convincing you that that's true, that that's what we're trying to do, right? If HO is not true, the expected value of mean squared error is still the same, or mean squared between groups, if you like that. Because it's only, think about what mean squared error is. It's the average variance in this group, plus the average variance in this group, plus the average variance in this group, divided by three. Sorry, the variance in this group, plus this group, variance in this group, plus variance in this group, divided by three. So it's the average variance within groups. Now, the, the between groups, or mean squared treatment, is the variance in your means. Part of that has to come from the fact that different people are in different groups. But part of that could, if HO were in fact not true, part of that could be because you're in different groups. Yes? Does that make sense? Right? Because it's just your average, and your average, and your average. So various those three averages. So the expected value of mean squared error is less than the expected value of mean squared treatment. Because treatment has error in it, due to the, right, it has the error of individual differences plus a treatment effect. Because it's the variance of the averages of each group. So in our numerical example over here, we got scores of 10, 20, 30. Those scores, if HO is not true, part of the variance in those, those, those three means is because you're all different people. And part of it is because you're in different groups. Keep it. And, and uh, the, S, the uh, EM and ST is just numbers? Is that oh, the N, it's number of subjects per group. And we're going to assume it's always equal. It doesn't have to be, but we're just going to make it. To make the world simple right now, we're going to make it the same. It just depends. Just the same number of subjects per group. You just weight it differently, that's all. OK. Does that make sense, though, that 
The variance in these means is due both to individual differences and any potential factor variance of due to treatment. Right? Does that make sense? Just which one is which? The, uh, the one on the right here is this one. Okay. It's, for treatment. it's an approximation of it. I didn't go through, I didn't wait at all on it. expected value of mean squared treatment is going to be greater than the expected value of mean squared error. If HO is not true. And remember, the alligator's mouth always points to the bigger piece of food. That's how you remember how you that less than this. Okay. So if we were to divide mean square treatment by mean square error, which I've got backwards, literally written incorrectly, which is mean square treatment divided by mean square error. And every year I say, I'm going to fix that, and I never fix it. I'm going to fix it. Sure I am. Um, we're going to now get an estimate of how much extra variation mean square treatment is measuring. Right? In other words, we're going to get variance due to treatment effects, or tau. Technically, n times sigma squared sub tau. Just tau is one. So really, what we have, sort of shorthand, is tau plus epsilon over epsilon. When we take the ratio of mean square treatment divided by mean square error, unlike what I have written in parentheses there, which is completely and utterly backwards, we're going to get tau plus epsilon over epsilon. We will go back to the more. Treatment effects plus error or individual differences divided by error or individual differences, whatever you want to call it. I like calling them error because epsilon stands for error, tau stands for treatment. I mean, there's a reason we use those weak letters. All right. That's precisely what happens in analysis of variance. This is exactly what we're doing. We're dividing mean squared treatment by mean squared error, which now is going to give us how much extra variation or an estimate of how much extra variance mean squared treatment accounts for. If it accounts for enough, we say we have a difference in our means. It makes sense, right? It's quite cool. Because I remember, this This is the one when I learned this in, in, in intro stats, I, when I remember learning about analysis variance, this is the one that's like, so why are we doing, this doesn't make any sense to me. Why are we dividing this by this, and how can this tell us anything? And it bothered me, because I get bothered easily, as I think most of you know. But also, especially if you follow my Facebook feed, <laughs> it's just me yelling. Today, the yelling was about people saying, you know, you, you, Facebook's changed everything, and you only get followed by 26 friends. So you only see 26 friends saying, so if that's true, say hello in the comments, which will add you. No, 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 no! doesn't work like that. Look things up. Snopes.com. Anyway. I do these things, by the way, to get myself interested again in class. Uh, I kid. I kid because I love it. Okay. You see why we're doing this? Pretty groovy, right? So F, which stands for Fisher, <coughs> that's the guy who developed this, Fisher. The F ratio is mean squared treatment divided by mean squared error, or mean squared between groups divided by mean squared between groups. It's also, you know, that's pretty good. 
So what's the expected value of f if h o is true? What's the expected value of f given h o is true? So look over here. We simplified over here. Tau plus epsilon over epsilon. If h o is true, what's tau equal? What's the treatment effect? Zero. Yeah. So what's epsilon divided by epsilon? One. Something divided by itself is one. Epsilon divided by epsilon is one. Triangle divided by triangle is one. Three divided by three is three is one. And we'll say three. Okay. The expected value, remember, expected value means if you did it a zillion times and over all those times, an infinite number of times, you would get one. It's going to vary a little bit. What's the expected value? So does everybody understand what the expected value of, a, of f if h o is true is 1? Does that make sense? Because tau equals 0. And epsilon divided by epsilon is, well, something divided by itself is 1. Okay. And 1 is the loneliest number. It's <laughs> old song. What's the expected value of f if h a is true? Ha. Huh. If ha huh is true. What? Would you say? Not one. That's true. It's not going to be one. Be a little more precise. Greater. Greater than one. Can it be less than one? Could it be less than one? Look at that. Tau plus epsilon over epsilon. Could it be less than one? What I'm asking you, in other words, is could tau be a negative number? Could the variance due to treatment effect be a negative number? Due to treatments be a negative number? Think about that. Could the variance due to treatment be a negative number? Why not? What, what do you mean? You keep going. You're on, you're on, you're on a good track here. So. I'm going to divide two negatives. No, because... No, no, I thought you were going the right way. <laughs> no, you tried. Trying. Look, guys, I'm not making fun here like I was the other day. Uh, I would be working with imaginary numbers. Please, no thanks. See, now you're closer. <laughs> Jake, what do you mean imaginary numbers, right? Square roots of negative numbers. Square root of a negative number is... Is the square root of the number times odd. Yeah. yeah. You can't do a square root of a negative number. The squared quantities, they're variances. They can never be less than zero. So there's no way it should ever happen that you get an f less than one. But it happens sometimes. Why would that happen? And it's not because we're dealing with imaginary numbers. So don't listen to Jake. Math boy over here. Let's go. Your name is now Math Boy. Damn it. The rest, the rest of the course. Because he paid attention when they talked about imaginary numbers when we were talking in grade 11. We did actually just bought that. I wrote that up for the week of this course. Really? <laughs> really? No, they we were taught that. imaginary numbers. Uh, they said the, that the numbers were imaginary, but they didn't talk about it or anything like that. They just breezed past it. Wow. My high school was subpar. No, but that means. The curriculum is scattered all the problems. Uh, I don't know what they teach. They really don't. It's weird. Um, okay. <laughs> but why would it happen that we get an F less than 1? Because it shouldn't be able to happen. How could that happen? Please, guess. The treatment caused less variation. Uh, no, it can't be that. Can't be that because it can't be, how could the variance, because that means a variance is a negative number, and it can't be. So it can't be that. You're going the wrong way thinking about the math. I think I'm thinking about this math. What can we expect it? Yeah. But it does negative, you do get numbers less than, you know, it'll be never be negative. It's, if it's negative, there's something wrong with your software or the calculations you made or your eyes. 
<laughs> you look at it wrong, or perhaps Satan is coming. You know, it could be something like that. That's much more unlikely than the other two, it seems to me, nonetheless. No, you know, it's a violation of an assumption. All the math is predicated on these assumptions we started out with. So what if one of the assumptions is wrong? Like, the variance is all the same. In fact, that's usually the problem. Usually it's a, you're violating something called the homogeneity of variance assumption. The homogeneity of variance assumption is that sigma squared sub 1 equals sigma squared sub 2 equals dot 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 equals sigma squared sub k. K is the number of groups, it's not always 3. In our case, it's 3. So it could be that. In fact, that's usually what it is. But you'll usually get something like 0 0.8, 0 0.7. That's OK. That's like no one's going to care. When you get like 0 0.05, 0 0.03 as an f value, you shouldn't be doing analysis of variance. You did it wrong. You probably did the math, right? Your, your software hits more than the numbers don't need to violate an assumption. And the number of times when I'm reviewing articles for journals, did people just report Fs of like 0.03? You they can't do that. This should trouble you. Then they fix it. And they're like, oh, that stats course I took actually was important. Yes, there's a reason it's required. So if HO is true, mean squared treatment but mean squared error will be distributed as F with two kinds of degrees of freedom. Degrees of freedom for treatment and degrees of freedom for error. It's got two degrees of freedom, not just one. I got a notification on my phone that's going to trade the NBA. I don't care. Basketball. I take basketball way more seriously if they were on skates and carrying sticks. That was what I'm saying is I just like hockey. Really. Ooh, the Olympics start on Friday. All excited? You, you have Olympic fever? No? Okay. I love the Olympics. Once every four years I become an expert in every sport. All guys are like this, right? You're watching luge and you're going, oh yeah, look at the way you took that turn. You have no idea what you're talking about. Or the worst is the, um, uh, what do you call it? The, the skiing, freestyle skiing. Right, you watch it and go, oh man, did he ever nail that? And the guy gets a horrible mark and you go, oh, it's completely fixed. And then the expert commentator shows you in super slow motion how part of the guy's leg moved. And you go, oh, I see. Is this about the Olympics? No, so, yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> um, MST just has to be greater than MST, right? Uh, yeah, it really should be, yeah. If for somehow we get it that it's not, does that mean we've done something wrong? Uh, it means probably you violated an assumption, and it's almost certainly the homogeneity of variance assumption. Okay. So, that, so that brings us again to the that being less than one. Yeah. That being yeah. less than one. Yeah. That's the only time that's going to happen. As we violate an assumption, and it's usually fixable. There's a way that we usually fix to fix this, and we'll talk about it when we uh, maybe next time, maybe the time after. But yeah, there's a way to fix it. That's the beautiful thing. You can fix that violation usually, right? You torture the numbers enough, they'll tell you whatever you want. But so there are ways to fix it. Um, but sometimes you can't because it's there's anyway there's things you can do. Well, we'll get there. You can, just, you can transform your data so you can take say, the square of all of them or into a reciprocal result. Uh, on the previous slide, you had the MST over MSE is yes. the edge variation that MST is not measuring. Yes. Which you said was the tab. Yeah. But then there you have that it equals F. F equals MST over MSE. Yeah. So That's what the extra variation is. It's the F ratio. So tau is F. No. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Okay, I can see what you're saying. Yeah, that's fair. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, in essence, that's what's going on. That's what ratio is measuring. Okay. No, that's fair. I've literally never thought of it that way, but you're saying correct. Well, inside. Okay. So it's not distributed as this. It's distributed some other way that we don't worry about. It. But the neat thing is, we, we, we know the probability. So we look up F with degrees of freedom for, for treatment and for error. We look it up in an F table and we say, oh, the, is the F that we got bigger than this? 
So let's say the critical value is, any, actually, anybody have their stats look on? Yeah. Yeah. Go to the um, F table in the back and look up the 0.05 level of significance for an F with, uh, oh, we started out with what? Um, it had three groups with three people in each, right? Nine, this would be two, nine, eight, seven. We have two and seven degrees of freedom. We'll get to why, where those degrees of freedom come in a second, where I got those from. Three and nine, nine, eight, ten, eight. sorry, two and six degrees of freedom. No. If you're going to get sigma squared sub tau, you actually have to. It's just giving us a ratio. It's not isolating it, but it's not. It's saying how much extra variation we have. It's actually not going to give you tau per se. Okay. Yeah. So what you uh, for two and six degrees of freedom? Yeah. Two and six because we have. That's assuming at the very beginning we have our example with three subjects per group and three groups. And I'll explain why that works. So you like six and two? No, no, two and six. Two and six? Yeah. Okay, so, so five point one. So if we did the analysis of variance, we got something bigger than five point one. I'm sorry, I'm five point one. Four. Point four. If it's bigger than that, you're going to say significantly different. Now, so we try to find that. So what we have is we call we have sums of squares and degrees of freedom. Sum of squares total equals sum of squares treatment plus sum of squares error. The top part is always something sums, something summed and squared. The part of it equals the total number of degrees of freedom, we have degrees of freedom for treatment, degrees of freedom for error. Okay? Any design has a finite number of degrees of freedom. For our example, with, with, with three groups and three subjects, we have eight degrees of freedom. Right? We have nine observations, eight degrees of freedom. Now we're going to divide those up. So, to be a little more precise, the sum of each score minus the grand mean, as was this x bar sub g, that's the total sums of squares. The sum of squares for treatment is the, this is the, is the number of subjects per group times the mean for group one minus the grand mean, plus the mean for group two minus the grand mean, we square those. And then each score minus its, this is calculating a variance, the top part of a variance for each group, and then we do them all, so we got all those for each group, and then we sum all those together. So it's big A minus one. How many things have we fixed? One, we have nine, in our case, nine, so big or big N degrees of freedom. How many things have we fixed here? We might look at that and go, wait a second, there's two means. Yeah, but the first mean on the one on the left doesn't know that it's a mean. Doesn't know it's a mean. The second one on the right, we fix that one. So we've lost degree of freedom. Remember, we have K groups, we have K minus one degrees of freedom. And then here we have big N minus K degrees of freedom. Wait, how, why is that? That's a sh that, that's sort of a, a shorthand kind of way to do it. For each group, so for each group to calculate its variance, we have what n minus one degrees of freedom. Yes, little n minus one. Little n is the number of subjects per group. Big n is the total number of subjects. How many groups do we have? Three. Three, how many groups do we have? Three. No, generally. Two? Generally. Zero? One, five, no, six, no, 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 no. It's your favorite letter. J. No. K. That's the one. <laughs> okay. K groups. Now, equals KN minus K. Number of subjects, sorry, number of groups, K, see this stupid motors in the way, K times N, number of subjects, equals big N. Big N minus K. Just, I'm just, just this. Algebra. <laughs> big N minus K. Okay. So, what we 
we end up with is something called an analysis of variance summary table. As source of variation, degrees of freedom, mean squares, and the f-value. Between groups, k minus 1. Within groups, big N minus k. Total, big N minus 1. So we had two groups, or sorry, three groups, so 3 minus 1 is 2. We had nine subjects minus three groups, so that's six, and then eight. So six and two is eight. Ah, oh, I did it right. Then we have sum of squares between groups divided by its degrees of freedom, sum of squares within groups divided by its degrees of freedom, and our f value is mean squared between groups divided by mean squared within groups. That's what you end up with. So all you want to do now is see is our f value bigger than a critical value of some sort. And if it is, we reject the null hypothesis. By the way, remember that null is that mu1 equals mu2 equals dot 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 equals mu k. All you're saying is at least two of those means are different. You aren't saying which two means are different. Or you're not saying three means are different. You're saying at least two of them are different from each other. It's about an overall pattern. It's not about individual means. Why analysis of variance works. That's the logic of it. And this is what it said on the assignment on your assignment. This is what? The one you were on the 16th assignment. I think it's the 16th. Yes, Bert. So I go way back. Yeah? I understand this. Yeah, good. But I don't know what it means. Like, I'm like a robot. I can do it, yes. but I won't ask any questions, and I just don't know what it means. I'm just doing it. I'm okay. doing my job. Yes. That's where I'm at right now. Okay. Remember what the null is. The null is that mu1 equals b2 equals, in our case, with three groups. Yep. This will tell us if that's not true. Okay. So if we get an f value that's big enough, we say, that isn't true. And then that, what does that mean if, if, if mu1 does not equal mu2, oh, sorry, mu1 equals mu2 equals mu3 is the HO, what's our HA? Because if we reject the HO, the only thing left is HA. So we're going to say, if that's not true, the alternative hypothesis is that at least two of those means differ. Yeah. That's what it's doing. So like, what are the values? What do the values mean? Like the 100 and the 100? Oh, values? those are just numbers I picked out of the air. Like our answers. What do our answers mean? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand what you were like, asking. So we solved that whole thing, we did all that hard work to get 100, right? Uh, okay. What does 100 mean? In this case, it's the average of these variances. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and then what? If we find out, we calculate these things, and we get mean squared between, divided by mean squared within, or mean squared treatment over mean squared error, we call them one. The reason I switched back to another one is because you might be used to that. And then we take a look and we look it up in an F table, just like we would the T test. And you find out, are the, is, the, is the obtained value bigger than the critical value? If it is, you reject the null hypothesis. So that's the value we're comparing to the table? No, 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 this is. So, so what so is that? Was that was me doing a numerical example of the, of the so first of all, uh, math I showed. So that's actually, that's some sort. That's mean squared within groups. So you just plug that in the table. Yeah. Oh, look at you said that. I don't know, but you. you I, I, I didn't understand what you were asking. I didn't know what we did with that value. Yeah. Don't worry about you doing it anyway. It's going to be done by a computer. Seriously. I mean, just understand why it works. 
But don't worry about doing it by hand. I, I wouldn't do it by hand. I'm going to your mind to do it by hand. I mean, you can. One way you know is actually, what this is called, is actually pretty easy to do by hand when you have very many subjects. But it gets difficult to do. Done. So the script. That's the, that's the top part. That's the top part. That's the top part of the, calcu of the calculation. The bottom part is the degrees of freedom. Okay. Yeah. And then what you did over here, that was subbing for another value in the table? The yes. Uh, that would be between groups. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that is it. Uh, so we use the difference between groups and within groups. We look at the numerator and the Uh, The difference, the okay. ratio. Yeah. And we compare it to our... We compare the obtained value to the critical value we look up in the table. Or the software. So K minus 1 and big N minus K minus 3. Two degrees of freedom. 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 Other questions? In fact, I'm really good, and I'm thinking of using this as assignment three, is explain analysis of variance to someone who knows nothing about statistics. X minus. Is it too late to drop out of this course? <laughs> I'm sorry? Is it too late to drop? Like, can you get. Why do you want to do that? I'm serious. No, no it's not too yeah. late. But can I, don't, I get my money back? <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't make those decisions. You can't get your money back. It's too late to end this. It's probably too late to get your money back. You can follow your course still next month, I think. I think it's four. I think you try to minus the extra. Still, the first day of new stuff just make you think you can't. Well, like, I understand the no problem in the stats class, no problem. Like, there's absolutely no problem. Yeah, yeah. Okay.